Welcome back to Morgan's video blog, Morgan's online blog in video format. Today, I'm here to share with you a very serious subject, consent violations and bystander intervention. With convention season in full swing, now is as good a time as any to talk about consent violations and how you can help. With the upswing of the Me Too movement, people are feeling more and more comfortable calling out behavior that makes them feel uncomfortable or worse. On this panel at Balticon 53, Lisa Adler Golder, Bill Lawhorn, Jennifer Povey, and Stephanie Burke discussed ways to avoid inadvertently or intentionally creeping, how people and conventions can discourage violations from happening in the first place, um, ways to help a target escape harassment, how to educate a violator, and what is the process if you need to report an incident. First off, what is a creeper? Now, there's a lot of worry out there about intentions being misunderstood and being accused of creeper behavior. Plus, there's this assumption that people who don't consider themselves conventionally attractive are going to be accused of creeping for doing the exact same thing that is welcome from more conventionally attractive people. Let's start off by leveling the playing field. Anyone can be creepy. No matter their gender or hotness rating level, those conventionally attractive people are just more likely to be labeled sleazes than creepers, but the behaviors are in the exact same category. Creeping is simply unwanted and unwelcome contact, either touching or verbal, or sliding into your DMs, etc. While it is true that some people with poor social skills have issues, often they'll find that people of the same gender aren't getting creeped out. And if you examine their interactions, you'll find that their behavior around people of the same gender is decidedly different. Trying to treat all people the same can go a long way to reducing any perception of creeping. Although, if you're just an asshole, maybe tone it down. Many people have been socialized that creating a fuss or making a scene is worse than putting up with unwanted and uncomfortable attention and creepers take advantage of that. Most creepers are pushing boundaries on purpose. They're probably not some conniving villain, but they are trying to pressure the target into giving them their attention, their time, and maybe more. So, ways to prevent harassment. The best way to prevent consent violations is to be aware of boundaries and stop harassing behavior before it starts. If you find that you have trouble reading cues, um, maybe finding boundaries doesn't come naturally to you. That's when you should ask for help. The panelists recommended specifically group dynamics therapy or workshops and lectures on communication especially focused on mirroring. So for conventions, if you're trying to, if you're working at convention, ways to help discourage uh, um, consent violations is to have a code of conduct. Um, badge ribbon activism can help. The little badges that people put on the bottom of, or ribbons people put on the bottom of their badges, like cosplay is not consent and kilts are not consent um, at conventions. Also modeling good behavior yourself and penalize offenders. If they're over the line or repeated offenders of smaller violations, don't hesitate to kick people out of parties or panels or the convention if necessary. Hopefully nothing escalates to police level, but don't be afraid to call if it does. Now, here's a note. Uh, legally, it is hard to share information about consent violations, etc., between events. Although publicly posted YouTube videos don't really count and maybe some opinions from participants in good standing, 
Word can get around, but it's on the whisper net. Unfortunately, we can't create a database because of liability, etc. So what are creeper behaviors? Sidling up to people who don't seem happy to see you or interested in talking to you. Staring, overly intimate behavior. Note, often when you meet a group of people, you'll see them be more casual about hugging and touch and remember that their comfort level has been built up over their friendship. It didn't start today. And just because it's okay for someone they know to do this doesn't mean it's fine for everyone. Um, creeping behavior is also skirting the line of acceptable boundaries and the subject is uncomfortable. Um, stealthing with cameras that upskirt shot, taking pictures of people who don't know you're there, etc. Startling people and then snagging photos or taking the opportunity to get in a little closer than you might have otherwise. Um, speaking of, getting too close to people on the bed or the sofa at a room party. Um, talking at someone and maybe cornering them and not giving them an opportunity to leave. Some people are, have been socialized not to interrupt, and if you don't pause for breath, they can't see an exit without being rude, and you don't want to do that. So, um, other ways people are creepy at conventions, um, at vendor tables, going on with the talking to people, monologuing at the vendor, often inadvertently or on purpose blocking sales because people aren't going to interrupt a discussion. Um, they think you're chatting with a friend and therefore the whole reason they're at the convention to connect with fans and also to sell their books or their web comics or whatever, you're stopping, you're, you're shutting down their business and their livelihoods. Um, and at vendor tables, the audience is captive and obligated to be at least open, if not actually straight up nice to people. So how can you as a bystander help when you see someone uncomfortable? First, determine if they need assistance. Evaluate their body language. Watch for social cues. Often the person targeted will be looking away, um, crossing their arms and hunching forward, stepping back, looking cornered basically so discreet ways to help sometimes you don't want to escalate but you want to help so you can stand between the target and the harasser in the conversation huddle but don't get too close they don't need a new source of discomfort secondly if you're helping someone at a vendor or a signing table call out i think it's time for the next person if you see someone trapped at a vendor table, start up a conversation with the vendor yourself. Once the harasser has moved on, move on yourself. Don't replace them. Um, invite the target somewhere else, even if it's just across the room. That's actually probably safer um, unless you know them very well. Um, start up a conversation with the harasser and distract them, giving the target an opportunity to get away. Um, model good behavior yourself again, and there's always the, excuse me, can I talk to Target for a minute? Um, sometimes though, you need more by calling out the behavior. Sometimes the time for subtlety has passed, or the behavior requires a more forceful intervention. In that case, do it loud and proud. Make sure the room or the people nearby know that the, this person has crossed the line and there is an issue. Once one person steps up, other people often feel comfortable helping, knowing that the help is both needed and welcome. Note, only call out their behavior if you feel safe doing so. There is no shame in not feeling safe enough. We'll go on to those methods later. You can call them out by saying, why are you messing with him, her, them? If they're being touchy-feely, grab the hand and ask loudly, what are you doing? Do you need help to the target 
or the harasser. Excuse me, what do you think you're doing? Or excuse me, could you repeat that? Or you can just straight up ignore the harasser and turn to the target, are you okay? So sometimes though, you don't feel safe intervening, especially um, in my case, like if the harasser is large and drunk or otherwise not sober, it can be dangerous to intervene yourself. Even if you are large, um, you don't necessarily want to risk yourself. Um, sometimes there's also a disparity in level of or perceived level of authority. So subtle interventions, as we listed earlier, can be very handy here, but don't always work. When the subtle interventions fail, options are take pictures or videos of the situation, call for backup, you can escalate, you can call a friend or a staff member or security. And finally, if you still need more support than that, call 911. And if you feel safe doing so, tell the harasser what you're doing. So sometimes though, you're not the bystander. Sometimes you're the one being harassed. Um, so what do you do when you find yourself being harassed? Um, here is the standard escalation process. First, ask them to stop. Um, hey, thanks for this conversation, I gotta go, or please don't touch me, or whatever else the situation warrants. Or could you move on? Um, I need to, I think I see another sale coming. Um, if they don't, ask someone else to ask them to stop or an authority figure to ask them to stop. And finally, ask for security to get them away. Once you're away from the harasser, should you file a report? Assuming the incident didn't require police intervention, this is 100% up to you and your comfort level. Most con staffs want to do the right thing. Things to consider if you're not sure the incident warrants a report. First off, did they respond well when you asked them to stop or move on? Did you have to escalate? Did they immediately find a new target? So once you've decided to file a report um, at a convention, typically you will go to con ops to file an incident report. Any staffer should be able to direct you or direct you to someone who knows where to direct you. They'll want the name of the person or at least a good description, what the behavior was and your contact information for any follow-up. Um, by reporting the incident, the convention now has a paper trail and that means they can penalize the offender as necessary. But also the paper trail makes it harder for people to downplay the incident later, especially in situations like the offender is banned, the staff changes over five years, and then the harasser shows up again asking to come back. We want to make sure that these things are recorded and that way we can be consistent and not um, make this place a safe haven for harassers. So um, are harassers educatable? Especially um, this part is especially for con staff looking to minimize future incidents. You might want to try and educate the harasser. Sometimes people make mistakes but not everyone is going to listen. When you intervene, do they seem open to critique? Are they doing active listening or are they full of excuses or talking over you? Ask their friends, is this normal behavior for him? Have, has she been warned before? Are there any extenuating circumstances? And is this a pattern, a one-off or a specific personality clash? All of these factors um, go into both the consequence and um, the, the written report because uh, repeated incidents definitely warrant a lot more action. So 
Uh, finally, the panelists shared some intervention success stories. Uh, they've been behind the scenes at conventions for years. Uh, Stephanie says it's just part of who she is and what she does, but she is ashamed when fellow con goers just keep walking and don't step up. Lisa considers it her job, but likes when harassers apologize and don't offend again. And Bill shared the story that at Capclave last year, the guest of honor told him that this was, quote, only the second convention I've been to where I wasn't harassed, which makes me worry about the other conventions. But the result, the guest is planning to come to the reunion. So let me know in the comments below if you've ever had a harasser and how you shut them down and uh, any other tips that I might have missed. Once again, thanks for tuning in for Morgan's video blog and feel free to subscribe. I'll be back again next Thursday with more writing tips and writerly musings. Bye-bye.